Today's episode of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast is brought to you by Poor Richard's Cafe and Star Local Media. Poor Richard's Cafe, Plano's oldest restaurant since 1973. They are open daily from 5.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., serving the three most important meals of the day, breakfast, lunch, and dessert. It is true Texas homestyle cooking made with love and grit at his Poor Richard's Cafe, located off of Avenue K in Plano. Welcome to another episode of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast. My name is Matt Welch. I'm the sports editor at Star Local Media, and I am being joined by Taylor Raglan and Justin Thomas. Uh, gentlemen, unless you're playing basketball in Frisco, we are midway through the uh, the district schedule for all of our uh, all of our girls' basketball districts. So, um, whereas in weeks past we've been talking just kind of uh, individual storylines here and there, well, we're going to uh, we're going to do what we uh, what we do basically for all the team sports, and that is our mid district progress report. We're going to take stock in all of our uh, all of our class 6a districts and just kind of size up where these teams are at the halfway point kind of how we're feeling about things going forward um, more of a uh, kind of a more detailed in-depth discussion than what we've had you know in previous weeks so we're going to split up at least for the podcast this week we're going to split one up we're going to talk exclusively 6a today we're going to talk on Thursday about class 5a so um, so with uh, with class 6a let's start um let's start out in Den County with district 66a um, right now at the halfway point the standings in district District 66A, you have Irving MacArthur, all alone in first place. They ran the table the first half at 7-0, followed by Hebron in second place at 6-1, Louisville in third at 5-2, Marcus in fourth at 4-3, four Flower Mound in fifth at 3-4, and four. a tie, actually, no, no, <laughs> Capel in <Sorry>. sixth. <laughs> <laughs> Capel in sixth at two and five, Irving Nimitz in seventh at one and six, and Irving uh, in last at zero oh and seven. So no ties. Is that a perfect very, all the way down. A very very game. yes. That's awesome. <laughs> the most organized uh, district yeah. standings that you could uh, you could expect through through seven games. I, I think I had that in volleyball in this district as well. That's weird. And then you'd think you with know, the football too. I think. With the parity in that district, you'd think that that would uh, would not exactly be the case. But looking at those standings, the first thing that jumps to mind is that the the preseason expectations for Hebron it feels like they are they've been validated in a big way. The Lady Hawks have uh, they have officially turned that corner yeah. in their development, and they are uh, they are back to being you know among the uh, one of the better teams in the Metroplex. So just kind of size up the Lady Hawks in just what has been a, a very impressive first half of district play. Really, you know, they were my. Um off-season bold prediction to make the playoffs this year after winning one district game over the last two years including none last year mm -hmm. and here they are at six and one only three losses on the whole season so even surprised my expectations I thought this would be a playoff team but I didn't expect them to be a team that could contend for the uh, district championship they won all three non-district tournaments they competed in this year wow. so they're okay. off to an awesome start they have an awesome backcourt. They have two juniors, Sierra Dixon and Deja Melton, who are back, and then they have a freshman, Cammie McKinney, who's taken over the point guard role okay. and allowed Dixon to kind of move off to that off-ball role a little more, and they are rolling. They uh, shoot the ball well. They play good defense. Um, they have a couple move-ins from Collierville, the Louder Mill sisters, Court Courtland and Jasmine, and they're playing well. They're adding more, kind of a th couple more three-point shooters. Still a pretty small team in size. They're going to have trouble against bigger teams but there's not a lot of those in this district and mm. really in the area to be honest so um yeah their little pressure defense their four guard lineup is causing havoc they're shooting well they had a big win on uh last tuesday beating louisville in triple overtime um so that kind of gave them second with louisville now a game back in third um so yeah, really good start for the, for the Lady Hawks under Coach Lisa Branch there. Do they uh, do they have what it takes to cut into that undefeated mark for Irving MacArthur? Do you think? Um, I don't know. They got, I would say yes. They got beat pretty handily the first time when they played them. I think they lost by 18. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, Louisville's hung in with MacArthur. Marcus gave MacArthur a game, so I don't see any reason why he, mm -hmm. Hebron can't give him a game in the second go around here. Those two will square off. I'm looking at the schedule right here. January 29th, that's a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. MacArthur will host that one. Yeah, you mentioned Hebron having to, you know, survive a, an overtime thriller against Louisville, and uh, obviously, certain that's that's been another team in this district that has firmly entrenched themselves among the District 66A elite. So, um, so let's shift gears, talk a little Louisville. Um, I kind of size up the Lady Farmers up to this point. What do you make of their first half? I would definitely put them in that elite category in the district. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they're in third place with two losses, but 
triple overtime to Hebron, and then they were right there with MacArthur losing their first meeting with MacArthur by only three points. So um, they're right in there. They have good guard play. Layla Lawrence is a beast down low as a sophomore. Um, they're pretty balanced, pretty versatile. They play good defense, and I don't see a whole lot separating these top three teams when mm -hmm. you look at MacArthur, Hebron, and Louisville, and then I think after that you're going to see a little battle for that fourth spot between Marcus and Flower Mound. Um, you have Coppell at two and five and six. You know they're coming off back-to-back -back playoff appearances over the past two seasons, but it just looks like this six-six A is as a compared to the nine-six A that they were in the last couple of years is just kind of a different beast, and they're having a little more yeah. trouble. Um, they're still experienced. They're, they're still talented. You know they're playing well, but I, don't, I wouldn't put them really in that playoff mix, even though they're mm -hmm. only uh, two games back right now. Between Marcus and Fireman, though, who do you feel like has maybe the inside track then for that last playoff Boy, spot? Coming in, I would have said, I would have said Flower Mound coming into the season, but Marcus got the head-to-head -head win. They've, you know, they were they played MacArthur. They lost by 12, but they were within five points in the fourth quarter mm -hmm. against MacArthur too. Um, kind of a surprise to me, but I, w I would have to give the edge to Marcus right now. But um, you know, with, with Whitney Cox and what Flower Mound has, you, you can't really count them out. Mm -hmm. But I would give slight edge to Marcus, if anything, just because they already have the head to head. I know yeah. that sounds kind of like a cop out, <laughs> but hey, that yeah. that matters though. Yep. We can shift gears, Taylor. Let you chime in on the uh, the happenings out in uh, at Mesquite in a look at District 11 6A. Let's see. At the halfway point, we have a tie for first place mm -hmm. between Horn and Rockwall. Both are at five and one. For the sake of tiebreakers, Horn has the head-to-head. -head yeah, I was going to say officially, Horn's probably in in first just yes. because they have the the head-to-head -head win over Rockwall. Yeah. Also, have a tie for third place between Tyler Lee and Longview at four and two. North Mesquite in fifth at two and four. Mesquite in sixth at one and five. And Rockwall. Heath rounding it out at 0 and 6. So, um, yeah, I mean, let's stick with those Lady Jaguars as they are they are atop the district, technically speaking. So, um, yeah, what is the uh, what is your take so far in the first half of district play for Mesquite Horn? I mean, it seems like at the top of the district, it's it's kind of another three team race because mm -hmm. uh, Horn has the win over Rockwall, but then Longview has the win over Horn for yeah. Horn's only district loss, um, and and all the teams have kind of gone back and forth a little bit. Obviously, Longview has that you know a game back, and you know Horn's beat Rockwall, so Horn I think is in a really good position mm -hmm. to you know vie for that district title um, and it should be decided here in the next week or so yeah. honestly because I think Horn has Rockwall uh, January 18th which is you know coming up um, and then uh, they have Longview the 23rd I think they play on Thursdays maybe and Wednesdays and, and some crazy days but it's, it's basically the end of this week and the beginning of next week they have those two teams um, and Horn and, and uh, Rockwall and Longview I should say so you know if Horn goes out and beats Longview and, and kind of avenges that loss mm -hmm. um, and especially if they if they beat Rockwall again um, you know that's the inside track probably to you know the district championship they start you know taking advantage of they just beat Tyler Lee um, which is you know kind of the team that um, I would expect to maybe get that fourth uh, playoff position because it looks like this district you know is really shaping up as kind of a, a top four bottom three situation I think the three teams in Rockwell Horn and Longview are kind of the ones that have a legitimate shot at a district championship. Then Tyler Lee is maybe a cut below them, but still a postseason team. And then, you know, you mentioned North Mesquite at, at two and four and Mesquite at one and five. Those wins are all kind of coming from beating up on Rockwell Heath and, and each other at yeah. the bottom. So none of those teams have really beaten any of those top four teams, and I don't really envision that happening. Um, you know, in Horn's case, you know, Devin, <laughs> obviously I'm standing in for Devin. He talks a lot about uh, Nia Boyd, senior. Um, Chalaya Washington, I believe, is that how you say it? You're name? on your own I believe one, so. Uh, <laughs> is a junior and a sophomore in Jasmine Shavers. So they have some <laughs> some interesting, you know, I, I, the word escapes me, but distribution, I guess, yeah. of, of talent up and down the classes. Um, Delana Choice, a freshman, is also having a good season. So, you know, it, it seems like they have the depth um, and, and the talent to – um, you know, stay up there at the top, and, and they've taken down some of these teams. You know, their loss to, to Longview was 67-52, which seems really strange, but then they go out and beat Rockwall 63-42. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of back and forth, but if they can show up like they did against Rockwall, you know, that, that team that almost beats Rockwall by 20, then, you know, it, it seems like it's Horns District to lose right now. So it is odd. I'm going with Tralia, by the way. Okay, <laughs> that's, hey, Tralia. It is odd because, yeah, Horn has, you know, their, their five wins all by double digits, and then you have a 15-point mm -hmm. loss 
at Longview. Now, for the sake of context, you know, that road game, that it's not a, a stone's throw away no. at Longview by any nope. stretch. And that road game at Longview gave Horn some fits last year. That game mm. was only decided by Horn won that game 48-46. to And they had to come back from down double digits in the fourth quarter to do so. So it's not without precedent that that road trip out to Longview has given the Lady Jaguars some fits in years past. But nevertheless, they will get a chance to avenge that one uh, fairly soon. Let's see as I scroll down the schedule. Looks like they, uh, well, they don't have it on schedule. Right now, <laughs> I believe it's yeah. the, the 23rd of January. Okay. So, it's, I mean, it's coming up. Okay. And like you said, it's... You know, it's a big difference between being there and being yeah. <laughs> being in Muskie. I mean, this is a district that, you know, the travel can get pretty heavy, and, mm -hmm. and in all sports, it seems like it, it affects teams. You would so. anticipate it kind of leveling out, though, yeah. and that home court advantage really yeah, playing yeah. out in the rematch. But, um, yeah, so just a, a look at District 11-6A and just kind of what is shaking out there. Um, whereas you talked about, you know, you know, you got three teams that look mm -hmm. to be firmly in the mix. Well, after Friday out in District 10-6A, it is a one-team race for the top spot in that district because um, Saxe is – just laying waste yeah, to everything in sight. It looked like <laughs> this was. Um, so yeah, you had last. Uh, so let's, first off, let me just run down the standings just to get everybody apprised of that. So at the midway point in District 106A, you have Saxe all alone in first place, as has been the case in recent years. Saxe at seven and zero. Rowlett in second place at uh, six and one. Lakeview Centennial five and two in third place, and then you have Wiley in fourth at four and three. Name and Forest one game back of the Lady Pirates. They are in fifth at three and four. You've got Garland in sixth place at two and five. North Garland one and six. South Garland zero oh and seven. And that was um you know since Devin primarily covers Saxe and Rowlett, we'll focus on those two. And that was the uh, you know kind of the big thing was because Saxe and Rowlett were both six and zero oh heading into last Friday. And you've got you know battle of the unbeaten's. You know winner gets uh, you know at least early on the, in the in the driver's seat for uh, for that District Ten Six A championship. Saxe won seventy one to twenty seven. Oof. And yeah. it was a uh, was it like eighteen to zero or something. Something they outscored him yeah. twenty three to two in the first quarter, and that was basically as, as firm a tone setter as as you could ask for in that one. For uh, for I mean, listen, we Saxe is state ranked. You know, are you know one of the you know one of the ten best teams in Class Six A right now? Number six right now in today's ranking. Yeah, so I mean, we all, we all know the book on there. them. They got the entire starting lineup back from last year's state semifinalist team, and they have very much played like one of the teams that should be in the mix to get out of Region Two once again come playoff time um, with that collective experience I mean you're I mean you look at players like you know Avery Krause who had 16 against Rowlett Tia Harvey Adele Tack Kayla Demas all four of them finishing double figures Rowlett's highest scorer had six points in Reagan Warren and you know it's no knock against Rowlett just Saxe's a, mm -hmm. a, a state championship contender yeah. and you're kind of seeing that play out and it's kind of familiar from years past where Saxe will you know will not breeze through but they will be you know they will emerge fairly unscathed from district play and um, just the fact that there is a, uh, a chasm of that magnitude mm -hmm. between the first and second place teams in the district really kind of just emphatic in how good Saxe still is. Um, their, their average margin of victory in the first half of district play, 43.1 points. <laughs> And they have been just as yep. they've been even more dominant since the turn to the new year. They are beating teams in the district by an average of 57 and a half in 2019. Uh, so they beat the number two team by larger than their average margin of victory. Yeah. Huh? Yes, that is one way to interpret that. That's which, <laughs> it's like the uh, the Allen Plano East football game. So much hype, and then one team, the dominant team, just nah. Yeah. We don't even want to mess with this anymore. Um, but, I mean, again, like I said, Rowlett is still in firm position to get yeah. that number two seed, which, I mean, that matters when you're looking ahead to the playoffs and oh, potential yeah. by-district seeding against District 9-6A. Yep. Um, the one seed's probably out of reach, you know, barring, you know, barring some catastrophe out in Saxe. But, nevertheless, if you can, the higher you finish, the, the better chance you stand at avoiding a, a team that'll be most potentially state-ranked. Although in 9-6A, who's, uh, who's current si fourth team in 9-6A right now? There is a tie right now between Allen, Plano, East, and Plano for fourth place, and all three of them have been state ranked within the top That's 10 what I mean. at like some point in time. Really Saxe would like to see the reigning state champs in the first round, huh? Yep. Goodness. <laughs> And that's uh, so, yeah, but nevertheless, with Rowlett, I mean, prior to that Saxe game, they had been taking care of businesses as you would expect. Their first six wins in District came by an average of 20 and a half points. Um, you know, their stud scorer in Gozi Obaneki, you know, she was averaging 24 points per game during that stretch, including, I mean, she's 
played, you know, arguably had her best games against, you know, their closest competition in that district, the Lakeview Centennials, mm-hmm. the Wileys, and that's such. Uh, she had an impressive line against Lakeview, 31, 6, 7, and 4. So 31 points, 6 boards, 7 assists, 4 steals versus the third place team in the district. Arguably the best non saxy player in this district. Um, yeah, just a big question in the second half will be if they can hold off Lakeview and Wiley to maintain that two seed, and I believe that they get both of them at home, so that should help their, help their case as well. I'm curious if Devin was here, if he thinks you could combine the four Garland schools if they can beat Saxe. No. No? I don't think so. You could combine Naaman, Garland, South Garland, and North Garland onto one team, and you don't think they could beat Saxe? I mean, they're averaging, their average margin of victory is over 40 points. That's true. How much are we cutting into that, really? Interesting hypothetical, though. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> hypothetical. And that is a look at, um, at the very least, three of our four Class 6A districts. So, uh, obviously, got one more. Got some District 9-6A to chat about. And um, beforehand, though, we will uh, kind of stick with District 9-6A for our student athlete spotlight. And we will, uh, Brian Murphy was out at Prosper uh, Monday morning to talk with their five star prospect, one of the best players in the country, Jordan Oliver. She has helped lead the Lady Eagles to a first place mark in one of the best districts in the state. Uh, Brian had a chance to chat with Jordan on her season and the Lady Eagles progress up to this point. We will see what she had to say after a word from the sponsor. Today's podcast is brought to you by Star Local Media. 14 newspapers and websites with a print distribution of 270,000 homes and monthly page views of 600,000 online. Star Local Media, your community voice for news. And now let's get back to the podcast. All right, I'm here with Jordan Oliver, standout guard here at Prosper. Uh, future uh, bear, uh, current Lady Eagle here at Prosper. Uh, y'all have been kind of the underdogs. I want to start off with this, Jordan. You know, coming in, the, coming into this year, no one was really, not many people were talking about y'all coming into this. You know, district of death, you can call it. You know, with Allen and the Planos, and even two really good McKinney teams. And here y'all are at five and one. What what has this you know first half of district been like? You know, kind of proving some some doubters wrong a little bit by you know beating quality teams like East Allen and the McKinney schools. Uh, it's a good feeling, you know, seeing everybody tweet about Allen and Plano East and even making us second to last in district. It was kind of a motivation for me, at least, to just want to go out there and play hard and show people that we, we deserve to be in 6A. We're not just some 5A team that it, we're good in 5A, but we come up to 6A. It was really good just to prove that we belong here and that it's not just a fluke of our winning. Now what has that been like, you know, coming in from 5A, you know, being the favorite in the district and dominating everyone and making that leap up to 6A regardless of who's in the district with y'all? Uh, it was scary, you know, going from 5A to 6A is a very big jump. It's not like going from 4A to 5A. 6A is a different monster. Everybody, every night you can lose, every day you have to come in playing hard. So 6A is just a really good it's a good district. I like I like 6A more than 5A. Now, y'all beat Allen last week. That was huge. Uh, Coach Rochelle told, told me that earlier that was one of the marquee wins of this program. How big was that win? How monumental was beating Allen? Uh, it was a huge win. Everybody talks about Allen. They call him all week. He kept telling us, they're this juggernaut. They're this juggernaut. And that's all people talk about is Allen. So to go in there and beat them by 15, it was a really big win. I think it was a good confidence booster for us to know, to just – validate that we're supposed to be here. Now, right now, y'all are in first place in this district at 5-1, and one, but there's still plenty of games left. Y'all still have to play everyone else uh, again in this district. What's it going to take to stay focused, to stay on track, and, and to come away with, with the district title, which many people did not predict? Um, I think that we just have to make sure that we still act like we're the underdog. We don't want to get the big head and think that every game we're going to win because we won before. To just really go in with the same mindset we did from the first six games and just do it again. So basically, we like to say, hunt. You keep hunting. Don't, mm-hmm. don't let somebody hunt for you now. You keep hunting for the people. Now, speaking of these teams in the district, who, who's the toughest or, or who are, you can mention a few girls, who are some of the tougher uh, players you've had to go up against just in this district alone? Uh, you know, you have Nia Green, who's number two in the state, and I'm number one, so we're always head to head. Jaden Owens, who actually didn't get to play when we played against them, but I know she's coming next time we play them with a lot of, a lot of heat, because we're, we're really close. And then Jordan Merritt, she's, she's tough too. They're both, me and Jaden and me and Jordan, we all played on the same AU team. So it's a really big competition just in that alone, just because all summer we got to talk a lot of mess to each other and then to try to come out here and prove it is, 
it's so hard. So talk a little bit more about that. I didn't know y'all were your friends. How long have y'all known each other, and, and how long has it been since y'all been playing with and against each other? Um, I've been knowing Jaden for uh, probably since freshman year, and I've been knowing Jordan Merritt since sixth, seventh grade. And this year was our one year we actually all played together on Sci Fair. And we didn't know going in that we were going to be district opponents. We just went in as teammates. But once like the districts came out and it was just kind of like a big rivalry that we started amongst ourselves just to see who's going to win because Plano's coming off of a state championship. So, you know, Jordan's like, I'm MVP. We're going to win. And then Jaden's like, we just want to make the playoffs. And then I was like, I just want to, I want to be both of y'all. I really don't care how y'all are. <laughs> and so it was just really big. It's competitive. We're, we're very competitive in the Sci Fair organization just to begin with but to play your two teammates it's competitive now speaking of your teammates and former teammates uh, Mackenzie Hewitt now who's your point guard your your running mate in the backcourt for your first three years here she's now playing d1 basketball at Yale what's it been like it's your first year without her you know her court vision was <laughs> insane what's it been like playing without her for the first time in your high school career um you know, I was used to having a point guard, somebody that I can go on the wing and drive from my position, but now I had to take the lead of being the point guard. And she's very vocal, and I was more of the quiet leader, but she's now, now I have to become more of the vocal one and talk more and learn and f fill that role without filling it too much. Uh, she's, I miss her a lot, just being, having a point guard, just to have somebody else to facilitate with and get me the ball when I want to get the ball in certain situations. Now, Ned, have you enjoyed kind of bringing the ball up the floor and being that point guard now instead of being, you know, that wing player or shooting guard or small forward or what, what have you? Yes, I think it's showed me a lot that I can actually dribble the ball and like I can run the plays. It actually showed a Baylor a lot too that maybe I could be a point guard. I could maybe be a bigger point guard for Baylor instead of just being a two guard. I think it's just showing that I'm very versatile and I'm not just a two guard that can shoot or drive past somebody. I can also control the floor. Now, speaking of Baylor, you just brought them up. <laughs> Have you been able to check out any of their games this year in person? You, how much do you watch them on TV and stuff like that? I go to every game I can. We went to the UConn versus Baylor game, which is a big win for us. Uh, I went to the game actually on Saturday against TCU. I try to see them as much as I can. I just love the girls and the, just the environment down there, but I just can't wait to get down there in a few more months. All right, thanks, Jordan. Thank you. Thanks again to Jordan Oliver for taking the time to chat with Brian for our student athlete spotlight. And um, yeah, on that note, let's uh, let's kind of stick with Jordan Oliver. Let's stick with Prosper. Let's stick with District 96A as we round out our uh, our mid district progress report series of podcasts. Checking out 6A girls basketball. Um, we are midway through the. Uh, 96A gauntlet, and at this point, just to uh, run over the district standings, you have Prosper all alone in first place at five and one. You got a three-way tie for second place at four and two between Allen, Plano Senior, Plano East, McKinney one game behind in fifth place at three and three, Plano West in sixth at one and five, McKinney Boyd in seventh at zero oh and six. Brian, we can stick with Prosper because obviously I think this has been. We weren't really sure what to, what to make of this district. It was like it was an ice cream headache trying to predict these standings. Um, back when this uh, when this district schedule first got underway, and I know uh, none of us saw Prosser being in first all alone at the midway point. So, uh, kind of just talk a bit about the Lady Eagles and just this uh, this impressive run that they've been on. So they've noticed, they've paid attention to our podcast over there at Prosper, okay. and they they uh -oh. checked out our ballots, <laughs> and that they may or may not have used some of it as bulletin board material. Uh, in the locker room and whatnot, but they, they talked about it, and you know, I'm not sure who it may have been Kendrick or someone uh, didn't even pick Prosper to make the playoffs, or I'm not sure. We'd have to go back I and look. I don't think I picked them to make the playoffs. I'm sorry, Ooh, Prosper. Matt you hate me. Welch, that's. But it's uh, tough because like there's so many really good teams in the district. Sure, like you're sure. getting like Prosper could win. Like seven, five, yeah, Prosper could win a district championship in like in <laughs> five, eight, just about any other district in the in the Metroplex. You just got you got to pick some state ranked team that was going to miss the postseason. It was no no knock against Prosper or anything. It's just a testament to how it's, good this district was. It's funny though because yeah. before the season it was Plano East, Plano, Allen, and Plano West. Yeah, and Plano. And yeah. those four teams were ranked ahead of Prosper in the state yeah. rankings. It was like, all right, Prosper, they're just left in the in the wayside. You know, maybe they might finish fifth and not <coughs> not make the playoffs. <laughs> and it was the same deal in volleyball. 
We were all like, ah. Oh, so, nah, I picked him in my box. I didn't think they were going to well, be good. I picked him. I, we all picked I him to finish no less, no worse than number two. Yeah. Okay, uh, but yeah. I, I felt like so, there was at least one ballot. I, well, we'll have to go back and look at that. It wasn't Kendrick's. <laughs> Don't add me. Don't well, add me. It wasn't me. But anyway, so it was kind of a similar deal in, in, in basketball here. Where it was like, all right, we're just discrediting the Lady Eagles. And here they go. They win their first five <laughs> district games. They beat Allen. You were at that game. Yeah, that was, that was it, a... Uh, that was my first time seeing Prosper. Mm-hmm. Very impressive performance, despite the like they were. This was a two to three, one to two possession game at the end of each of the first three quarters. Despite it feeling like Prosper was in very firm control of that game, their defense is um, their defense is arguably the best in the district. I got the number right here through um, the first half of district play. They're allowing just forty three point seven points per game. Um, they turned over Allen almost at will in that game. It felt like, and even though like even then though they were still only up by two points, I believe entering the fourth quarter, and then they just flipped the switch and just beat the brakes off the Lady Eagles, and it was. <laughs> Just, I mean, they were the ball movement was so sharp. They were just shutting down Allen on, on defense, and they, uh, yeah, it was it was a quarter that, um, you know, afterwards, you know, they were talking about one of the best quarters maybe in program history, considering the caliber of Allen's program. Because Allen was ranked number ten in the state at the time, Prosper number fifteen, and Prosper just, it was, you know, I was in awe of just how well they played in that fourth quarter. <laughs> I mean, you had Jordan Oliver who was kind of picking her spots, you know, th- all throughout the game, and then she kind of goes into takeover mode mm-hmm. there in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, she is either scoring or assisting on just about every basket of theirs. Scout Huffman's putting in work down in the post. I mean, they were just having their way with Allen. And see, that's something that's changed in Oliver's game this year. Because last year they had Mackenzie Hewitt, mm-hmm. who's now playing at Yale. She was their star point guard. She could find anyone on the floor. And she was a sharp shooter. Now Jordan Oliver, she's moved from, you know, wing slasher, kind of like a two or three player on the court. She's now the point guard. So she mm-hmm. always has the ball in her hands. And she's thriving. She, you know, she's averaging four assists per game on the year yeah. on top of 20 points per game. And that's something that Co- Coach Rochelle told me this morning when I met with him. Uh, you know, he's saying her game is just all around. That's one thing that Baylor, where she's yeah. signed to go play next year, it really likes about her game. She's not just a scorer. She's not just a post player, not just a three-point shooter, whatever, rebounder. She literally does it all. And she flirts with a triple-double mm-hmm. nearly every night and against top-notch competition in 9-6-A. It's obvious she's the main reason of this team's success. But you mentioned Scout Huffman. Oh, yeah. She was a sophomore last year. And she had glimpses of, you know, she could be a special player, but then she'd make a sophomore mistake. This year, she's that 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 presence in the paint that they need, you know, something that they really didn't have last year, and, and she's playing well, averaging almost double digits. Yep. Maddie Cleary, oh, sharp yeah. shooter on the wing. Sharp shooter. If you find her on the wing, yeah, yeah. she is knocking She down can let it up. Oh, yeah. She, a, a, a normal for her is three three-pointers a game. Yeah. That's like the minimum for her. And when you have that, when you have a presence in Scott Huffman, and then you have Jordan Oliver, and you have, you know, Maddie Willis-Rosa, who's a feisty, tenacious defender. She, and she... You know, you know the whole roster. Uh, no, yeah. she... Oh, yeah. That was, in my eyes, the MVP of that game against wow. Allen. She held Nia Green to two points. A five-star nice. prospect, Madison Willis-Rosa, they basically put her on Nia Green, and there's definitely some physicality going on between the two of them, but and nevertheless... She's not big. Rosa's not big. No, no, not she's big. not, but no, she yeah. was She was basically Nia Green's shadow in that game. Mm-hmm. Very impressive stuff, and yes, that was, I think, the big... The, the biggest takeaway from that was just her individual defense, how instrumental that was in shutting down one of the best pound-for-pound scores in the entire sure. district. And she's not going to light it up like Oliver, Maddie Cleary in the, no. in the scorebook, but it's little things like that, you know, having a lockdown yeah. defender so Oliver does doesn't have to do that or clear doesn't have to do that or whoever else doesn't have to do that so when you have all those pieces playing their roles and excelling in their roles on top of having a superstar mm-hmm. you know that that's a recipe for a five on one start yeah. in the I, best district in the state we've been talking about just the importance of we know what these superstars are going to bring mm-hmm. night and night out in this district but it's what are you going to get from the supporting that's cast right. that's that's what that's one thing with uh, mckinney mm. mckinney's three and three they played tough with everybody. Even Boyd, Boyd hung with them. They they beat them by eleven. That game was way close to eleven points. Yeah. The only they got blowed out by Allen by twenty five. But all the other games have been single digits. They took they Prosper beat, to overtime. They yeah. took Prosper overtime. They upset Plano. And if they're gonna they're right now, they're the outside looking in. They're not. And then the Catbirds see like oh, Prosper. They're three and three. And I think um, they're gonna have to beat Prosper Allen. Plano East or Plano, they're going to be two of those four teams mm-hmm. if they want to return to the playoffs. 
And they need they got Aaron Fry. She's put up 19.5 points a game. She went from nobody talking to her. She's getting looks from SMU and everything. Nice. But they need Trinity White and they need Nick Porter. They need a number two girl or as Shaquille O'Neal likes to say, the others to step up. Mm -hmm. They need others to step up. And that's kind of like the theme of the district. Like, you know, the star going to get you 19 to 20 yeah. points. What can your supporting cats do? And for looking at Prosper, I mean, their role players do pass the eyeball test as mm -hmm. far as being one of the more capable supporting units in this district. They did run into some trouble on Friday, though, against Plano. You know, they were 1-1 away. And granted, I mean, no team was going to go undefeated in this district. No. That would just be just be insanity with this talent <laughs> that this district mm -hmm. is. They did get tripped up by Plano, though, in a uh, in a 48 to 40 loss on the road, albeit. But um, you know, the big takeaway from that and just watching the Allen game versus the Plano game is just Plano's zone defense is when they're locked in on the defensive end and they're able to rebound the way that they're capable of. Because Plano does have a lot of size down low, and that was one thing that uh, they really seemed to kind of lord over Prosper was really limiting the Lady Eagles to uh, to one shot, yeah. and. And then on the other end, I mean, they're, you know, Plano's, they're not going to, you know, dazzle you from beyond the arc. They've got some girls that'll shoot threes, but it's not a, three, a team that's going to get hot from the outside, per se. They're, a lot of their shot selection is going to wind up at the rim. And, you know, as Plano part of this three-way tie, you know, for second place, you know, the read on them has been this season, you know, they will, it, the defense and rebounding are kind of the cornerstones of their identity, which is to be expected with players like, you know, Maggie Robbins, Zaria Collins, Jordan Merritt. Um, and then you, but it's, their big bugaboo has been free throws and you look at the losses to McKinney the loss to Plano East um, you know coach Belcher just reciting I mean just how I mean just performances where they were shooting sub 50% from the line oh, and, the Lakers. That's and that's kind of <laughs> that has been a sore spot for Plano and something that you know had coach Rodney Belcher you know and his staff has definitely taken note of they've ramped up their preparations during practice as far as trying to remedy those free throws um, it was a, a little bit better against Prosper just mm -hmm. 8 of 14 so just one above 50%, nothing, you know, not, it's it just signs of progress, nothing that's fully resolved on that end, but nevertheless, they made the ones that they had to make in the second half oh. to keep Prosper at bay, and when they're able to do that, I mean, again, the, the, the talent you know, that they have down low with Collins and Merritt, and just their ability to score almost at will in the paint, Maggie Robbins just pinballing her way through defenders in there for some off-balance floater, they've got a lot of weapons you know, Michaela Eddins, you know, who's kind of become a, I mean, she had six assists in the first half of that game against mm. Prosper kind of very, almost Katie Farrell for players who remember the Plano team of last year as kind of being more of a, a floor general and a facilitator in transition with some of the looks that she had setting up her teammates. I mean, it's the talent is there, and it's just, again, it's it's the self-inflicted wounds, like missed layups, missed free throws that have kind of held this team back from, you know, being in the catbird seat like Prosper is. So How much is that championship swag? Like, they... Now, we've been here, mm -hmm. we've done this, you're not panicking. How much of that do you think is going to play a role in the second half of district? Well, you're seeing with a player like Jordan Merritt, just and Zaria Collins for that matter, because they are the two players that have the, you know, the lion's share of that experience from the state championship team and just the maturity that they play with, especially, you know, a, a player like Merritt. Her, I mean, they, they're posting her up a lot more than it feels like they were last year. I mean, her her drop step and She's finish is, <laughs> I'm not sure how many shots period in this district are tougher to stop than Jordan mm -hmm. Merritt down on the left block or whatnot. I mean, yeah, her post game She's is very impressive. See, uh, all of this. I saw her as a sophomore last year and it gets um, um, McKinney's big three one there mm -hmm. in college now. She put up 21 and 12. Yeah. And each one of them took turns guarding there, and she was giving it to yeah. them mm -hmm. over both shoulders. And Zaria Collins, who sets the tone for their defense and is a really, you know, really s strong passer from the high post, sets up Merritt very well, and she'll get her points inside as well. She does a lot of the uh, kind of the dirty work, the lunch pail work for this Plano team. It's who had the tough task of guarding Oliver in this game? Because she only had 10 against Plano in the loss. It's a zone. That's the thing. They run a zone. So it's exactly. not like any one player was Syracuse assigned. Style. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't any one player that was assigned, but the zone defense really seemed to, like with the exception of, like, Coach is, how do, you, how do you say his last name? Rochelle? Rochelle. Okay, I was going to say Rochelle. <laughs> Trey, <laughs> Trey Rochelle. I didn't want to mispronounce it. But um, he said afterwards that he thought that the uh, basically the first two minutes of the game were the best that they handled that zone <laughs> that zone defense. O otherwise, beyond that, you know, Maddie Cleary got loose you know, a little bit in the second quarter. Mm -hmm. She had 10 points in the second quarter. Um, Scott Huffman had some, you know, good work down low. But they, they just weren't ever really able to put together a consistent run. You know, Oliver, she had her moments there, but she tried to, you know, get it going there in the fourth quarter, but it just wasn't falling for her that night. The, um, the entire team just really had I mean it was they only scored 40 points you know and that's yeah. their I believe that is tied for their second lowest scoring output on the season and Plano's defense will do that to you not not 
Do they play to level their opponent? Because um, I remember that at uh, I covered McKinney Boyd. Mm. They're in a 34 game losing streak in district play, but that's not all negative as you would think. Mm. I would I would strongly feel if they were in any district but this district, mm -hmm. I know they have some wins. I actually think they they can play off caliber. Mm -hmm. Like they played Plano and took them to the wire with their best players Zoe Jackson and Foul Trouble mm. the whole game. They um, play head to head with um, McKinney and um, somebody else they've hung up hung Zoe with. Jackson can ball. Yeah, she's, she she's probably like, the best sophomore in the yeah. uh, in the mm. area, one of the best top two. Yeah, she can shoot, yeah. So but um did they play to the to the to the competition? Um or just I, the I think they the strides because boy, shout out to Coach Lawrence are doing a good job. It's like they're 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 there to upset somebody. Mm. They're gonna bust somebody's balloon. It doesn't matter mm. who balloon's gonna get busted. We talk self inflicted mistakes. I want to say that Plano missed double digit free throws against Boyd. So it's mm. just more the more the same as far as again if they're if they're knocking down their free throws, that is you know that could very well be the best team in this district. Okay, I was about to ask you that. Are they the most well rounded? Because we know about all the superstars that Wes mm. and Allen and Prosper and Plano. That, you know McKinney. They all have that stud. That one go-to four-star, five-star recruit, mm -hmm. whatever. But is Plano the most balanced of every team in this district, or is that too close to call? Um, I, I mean, it is really close to call. I mean, I did said I didn't think Prosper. I mean, having, having seen Prosper twice last week, I mean, they look the part of being. I mean, that five and one isn't a fluke mm -hmm. at all. I mean, like I said, they're it, we. I, you know, you knew what to expect out of Jordan Oliver, but I was you know mainly monitoring their role players, and I was I mean players like Scott Huffman, Madison Willis, uh, Maddie Cleary. They all. I mean, I said Plano probably doesn't have that surefire floor spacer. You know, like like a Maddie Cleary, but nevertheless, they they do have. I I would say maybe the most versatile roster just because of the. I, I remember mentioning a ways back. They got a lot of players that are capable of handling the ball and can mm -hmm. run a fast break, and that I think is a really kind of an underrated strength because a lot of times when you see when a team gets a defensive rebound, it's mainly UK. You look to you know make the outlet pass to one person who's going to commandeer your fast break. Well, with Plano, it can come from any which way. They've got you know Merritt, Collins, uh, Mikhail Evans, Maggie Robbins. They can all bring the ball up and they can all yeah. make stuff happen well, in transition. Ball ball handlers is a very key. That's yeah. what that's what uh, the, the, a big difference from McKinney. They had three ball handlers mm -hmm. last year. In fact, Aaron Fry played off the ball, who's their main ball handler this year, just because she didn't have to. Yeah. Now she don't bring the ball up. It's kind of like you, you like can't get past ten seconds. Give mm -hmm. me ten seconds. With um, we've got two other teams that are in that mix for a uh, you know for the uh, the top spot in the district that are just trailing uh, Prosper by uh, by one game, and that's Allen and Plano East. Uh, I like watching Plano East. Plano East is that that um, that Memphis Grizzly type team. They they grit and grind. Yeah. If it ain't rough, it ain't right. They they they, they, they gonna take you. You want the scratch and call when you play against them. Man, shout out to Tavi Diggs. She has one of the best all around games I've seen. So yeah. far, her step up game, her pull up game, she had it going against McKinney. You can see why she's the reigning MVP. Yeah, Tavi Diggs, reigning District Six Six A MVP. She's it's not a fluke. It's not a fluke. She is. Uh, she's averaging eighteen and a half points per game in district play so far. Um, with that, I got to see them against Allen in a game that they lost in overtime. And the big storyline with them is you have Tavi Diggs. You know what you're going to get out of her, but it's just uh, they're really young beyond mm -hmm. Tavi Diggs. They've got. I mean, they play. They got the shooters though. They got hot in yeah. the first half. Mm -hmm. Against um, McKinney, they hit eight threes, and in the second half, they only hit one. Really? And McKinney turned a 28-point lead into, uh, they cut it down to five. Yeah, I mean, they've got, you see, you're seeing kind of in re in recent weeks, because that's like, Plano East started off District 1 and 2, but they've turned, they've really picked it up, though, since the start of the new year. They've won three consecutive district games. Um, you're seeing now Kendall Parker really kind of emerging as that, uh, as that you know, 1B to, to Tavi Diggs 1A. But again, I we've been, you know, myself and Taylor Raggett have been pretty consistent that, like, a lot of their season is going to come down on the strides that are made by a lot of their underclassmen because they do play some, you know, some big minutes for some freshmen and sophomores. You know, players like you know Kendall Parker's only a sophomore, but players like Kayla Cooper, Tiana Amos, you know, Ada Anamekwe comes off the uh, comes off the bench and gives them some good work. Uh, you know, the game that I saw against uh, against Allen, she's not a you know a freshman or a sophomore, but Nina Ritchie did some good work on the boards. They're a team that's again they're. This is the best team that East has had in, you know, it feels like, you know, a, f a few years. It's, there's been a nice resurgence on their end, especially, you know, since the turn of the new year. It's just, again, what, um, how are those those younger players going to work through kind of the, the growing pains yeah, that can come with the district? Because you saw against Allen, like, they played Allen really well, were in position to win that game. They give up a game-tying layup with 20 seconds left, go to overtime, and then Allen outscores them. Well, they go on a 10-0 run to start overtime. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, head coach Sherilyn Morris kind of charged Talking that up to just the uh, kind of the the shock of letting it kind of get away in regulation and not really knowing how to respond against a you know a more seasoned team like Allen and again there's going to be some 
you know, some little growing pains within this year for Plano East, but there's enough talent there to where, you know, if they uh, they can overcome that because there is, you know, because they do have the skill to hang with just about any team in this district. And you're seeing, because, I mean, they that loss against Allen, that was a very winnable game. Um, you know, it sounds like they, they hung with Prosper, you know, for, a, you know, for a, a good chunk of that one and, you know, we'll get a chance to avenge that loss on Friday. Um, I mean, they're, them being 4-2 in this district isn't a joke either, you know, and with... with took it to McKinney in the first half. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they, I left the halftime, but they were up like 20, by 28 points, 28, mm-hmm. 26 points, and they, they only won by five, but you, you could do that when you have a 28 point lead. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's off the gas. And then, then with, with Allen, like, they're like they're four and two, but those two losses have been by an average of 18 points. I mean, they got mm-hmm. shellacked by Plano by 20 in their own gym, and then the game against Prosper, which they were again they were within arm's reach despite committing just a whole flurry of turnovers, and then Prosper just ran them off the floor in the fourth quarter. With with Allen, like because this was our projected, you know, favorite to win the district, and it's it's a case where the. It's a team that should theoretically have the arsenal capable of beating anyone. I mean, they have, I, you know, I talk about the size that Plano has down low. Like, I think that a team like Allen is best equipped to handle that because of the size that Nia Green and Zoe McCrary are able to bring to the table. I think that Alicia Mills gives them some pretty valuable length off the bench, and she was one of the standout players in that game against Prosper, despite, you know, Allen losing. Their things are just kind of like between the ears right now. <laughs> things like shot selection, they will, uh, mm. you know, they will settle for a 12 foot shot versus working the ball around for a two foot shot things like that they'll have moments they have moments against prosper where like they're just kind of looking around not entirely sure of what play to run just things like where the light bulb kind of goes out momentarily and you're just the margin for error in this district is so it's small true. that you yeah. just you can't have those slip ups so you lose one game that can yeah. cost you a playoff spot but the thing is and like but you look at how they've responded to these two losses i mean they said they got hammered by playing a loss by 20 they turn right around go to mckinney and beat them by 25 a mckinney team that's you know right in that playoff mix just as well you know they lose to Prosper by 16. They turn around and they beat Plano East. You know, eight, not Plano East, but Plano West, 80 to 56. Wow. So it's there. Like it's they're capable of playing a. Uh, you don't a, know which Allen team you're going to yeah. get. It's a coin high too. So the consistency has been a bit of a you know, and it's. It, you know, you look at a player like Nia Green, and that was the big storyline coming into the season for Allen, is getting Nia Green back after the run that she had at Bishop Lynch. You know, she played for Allen as a freshman. She's back with the program now as a sophomore. I mean, she's averaging, you know, 18.3 points per game, so right in line with what Jordan Merritt's doing, right in line with what, uh, you know, Jordan Oliver, with what the best players in this district are doing. And you look at um, kind of how how her offensive game goes is kind of, you know, how Allen goes in a sense. So she's got four, um, she's averaging 24.3 points per game in their four wins oh. and only eight points per game in their two losses. So she's, she's, she's a true barometer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's, um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, there's the, the talent is there. It's just, again, just they, they'll have, they'll have nights where again, just the, for whatever reason, the light bulb just kind of goes out. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, I mean, their, their ceiling is, you know, arguably the highest in the district, you could say. Now, one thing to note, the state rankings are out again today. They're updated. Mm. Only Prosper and Allen from 96A are on there. And Prosper is ahead of Allen now at 16 yeah. and Allen at 17. Mm-hmm. And just remember, four weeks ago, there was five, five teams Yeah, in this that's the thing about this district the is 20. these teams are just going to cannibalize mm-hmm. one another. Um, we haven't mentioned Plano West yet, and that's um, you know it's it's kind of a tough spot for Plano West to be in because you know we talk about the twenty five points a game the, on the bench, the star power in this district, and one thing you gotta that's going to contribute. Mm-hmm. We talked about the importance of supporting cast and all the different intangibles that go into being successful in this district. You also gotta have a full deck, and Plano West does not have a full deck. In fact, it's not like they're missing just one card; they're missing the ace, the king, the queen, the, the jack. I mean, <laughs> without Jaden Owens, it's just been um, it's been some that's tough sledding for Plano West. Um, they've had moments where, you know, so Plano West is, is one in five, you know, their lone win coming over uh, over McKinney Boyd. And it's, you know, I mean, you saw you saw them against McKinney. So what was, I mean, because, like, they've still been competitive in moments. Like, they gave East a great game. You know, they almost beat yeah. Plano East. They yeah, almost they beat McKinney. McKinney. Um, and you just, you wonder, it's got to be, you know, kind of that's, maddening. That's, in too a, much, that's too much to overcome. I think you, you have a D1 or going to... Going to UCLA, and I think she was averaging twenty five point three points a game. So oh, yeah. that's twenty five points a game. You got so many people to make up for, and they and um, Coach Grassi, I only talked to her one time after mm-hmm. they played McKinney. Said they basically got girls in roles that they're mm-hmm. not used to, but they got to. Because oh yeah, because because you so that's, that shifted everything. They've been hey, this is going to be your role, and oh no 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 no, yeah. now you got switched. So that's kind of hard to ask any guy or girl that's a teenager. 
to do on the fly like Because you got to think that that roster and that rotation was constructed with players that you know work well alongside mm -hmm. a player like Jaden Owens. And without her, like you said, yeah, it's players having to acclimate to, to duties that they just aren't you know weren't expected to you know to take on. And said they've had moments. You know, Morgan Smith lit it up against McKinney. Almost was hey, enough three. to <laughs> almost was enough to will them to that to uh, you know to that victory. And you I'm know, talking about step back, like mm -hmm. like Luka Doncic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not like that, but she has a quick trigger. I mean, yeah, she played well against Plano. We said 15, Amaya Brandon had 12. They said there's there's moments where they look like it's starting to get together, but it's again without Jade Owens, it's just it's tough to get much consistency. Yeah. With I would say it's seen it's a personnel, it's a personnel, but that big clog is not there. Yeah. Versus it's a uh, chemistry or coaching. Yeah, because this is I mean this is a five star prospect. You know, one of the one of the best shooters in the district, a player who can you He's know 25. Oh yeah, can create easy offense for herself, create easy offense for her, you know, for others. And just without that, it's just you're just already up against it so much in this district. Where again, you're going up against some of the best teams and players in the country. <laughs> Jaden Owens not playing is stating her case for district MVP. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just look at the record how they are yeah. without her. You know. Um, yeah, so I guess is there, um, I don't know, is there anything else you wanted to add about the district? Feels like we've we've touched on everybody in a sense. It's gonna I, I it's gonna be madness. I'm gonna see an upset or two. And oh, she, yeah. and if Jay didn't come back uh, healthy, they'll have an impact on not necessarily for them as a mm -hmm. team, but they could beat one of these top teams. Oh yeah, without sure. question. Somebody yeah. in, and it, it'll drop somebody somebody that was four and two or five and one this oh, round yeah. could be three and three oh, yeah. or even two and four. It's and wild two. right now, but it's gonna be insanity once Jay Nolans comes back from injury. Yeah. We shall see. Yeah, should be. We got what three weeks left of this, uh, three of this, uh, this little shooting match. So we should see. Should be. A, should be a fun one as District Nine Six A begins its second half on Tuesday, and that'll that'll at least wrap up the uh, the Class Six A portion of our Mid District uh, Progress Report podcast. We're going to touch on Five A later in the week. Talk some Frisco ISD. Talk some Denton County, McKinney North. All our Five A programs. Um, Y'all check that one out. Otherwise, folks, I hey, appreciate y'all for checking out this podcast. For myself, Brian Murphy, Kendrick Johnson. Uh, you know, thanks to Justin Thomas and Taylor Ragland for tagging along as well, folks. You enjoy your week, and we will talk to y'all later.